You are listening to The Gospel of Peace, a podcast for kingdom women and everyone else about political theology and everyday faith. I'm your host, Rebecca. I'm the editor of the Kingdom Outpost, kingdomoutpost.org, and I'm a PhD student discovering how the gospel of peace transforms us in a world full of violence, fundamentalism, abuse, nationalism, and more. This is part two of an episode that really covers what this gospel of peace is. In the previous part, I talked about what it means to have a Christ-centered hermeneutic. I talked a little bit about Harold Bender's Anabaptist vision, which talks about basically what it means to be a Christian, which is to be a follower of Jesus, imitating Jesus, which should be super, super obvious from the Bible. But that was mainly the big thing about so-called Anabaptism, which is really a, a construct in a way because it was a way to marginalize what the Anabaptists were saying and make it as part of some weird sect when it really is an attempt to be simple, faithful, Jesus-centered Christians and really dig into what the New Testament teaches and says. I talked a little bit about the separation of kingdoms, so I'm going to be digging into the scriptural foundations. These are verses that I found for myself, like Bender, I, there was only one verse in here, and maybe it's really obvious, but there's a telephone game happening, like I said. Bender is sort of explaining what the Anabaptists believe, the Anabaptists were basically just trying to say what like, this is what the New Testament teaches. This is what every Christian should do. And we don't have their full, like, working out of where in Scripture, how in Scripture. And so what I did in studying this as a political theology, like, I'm a Christian, but how should I relate to power and politics and government and war and all of that? And I realized, actually, it is based on a soteriology, which is a theology of salvation, what salvation actually means. So it was super exciting uh, reading the scriptures, recalling to mind different verses, and really studying in depth what all this means uh, from a scriptural perspective and realizing that it actually teaches something pretty awesome, a more holistic picture of salvation. So let's start by talking about defining peace, and then we'll define gospel. So peace in the Hebrew originally, it's like shalom, just to bring in a little bit of a more well-rounded definition. And you can go and look it up yourself on like Strong's Concordance, what shalom means. But it's not just the absence of conflict, it is also wholeness. Like think of the, the, the hymn, like when peace like a river, uh, you know, it fills your whole soul. It is a state of being and it is so, so precious. So let's go through the verses. Isaiah 9 verse 6, which we believe is a messianic prophecy as Christians, says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now in John 18 verse 36 Jesus said, yeah, you are right. I am a king. And so this kingship of Jesus um, is also closely intertwined with who he is as a prince of peace. Interestingly, it just came to mind, the Roman Empire saw itself as a harbinger of peace. Like it's literally called Pax Romana, which is like the peace of Rome. Rome brought about peace by conquering, subjecting, uh, promising to get rid of the barbarians at its borders that would threaten its inhabitants. But Rome ruled by literally violence, conquering, uh, content warning, by sexual assault, by, and this is like literally depicted on their tapestries and, and celebrate like celebrations of war. Like this is what they did. This is what ancient armies did. Rome ruled by threat. That is what crucifixion served as, according to Figuero, Figueroa and Tombs 2019. Like crucifixion was literally an act of terror designed to scare people into never rebelling against Rome. So Rome proclaimed a kind of peace that was a false peace. But Jesus came in a very completely like different manner and promising to us Christians true peace 
as the prince of peace and he did not come the way that caesar would come you know conquering and subjecting he literally came and died at the hands of the roman empire and that symbolism of of the cross there's so much to unpack there which we will do in a future episode but that is all to say that sometimes there is a false gospel piece i call it the ungospel of empire and jesus comes to bring what we believe is the true gospel of peace uh for the kingdom of god is a is not a matter of eating and drinking but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, verse 16. So this is the kingdom of God. We are called to belong to this kingdom of God, and it is a kingdom not just of forgiveness, not just of atonement or righteousness. It is of peace. It is a kingdom of peace and joy. We really, really need to understand this because we often hear that whole Roman road thing, you know, the wages of sin is death, you sin, therefore you're going to die, and then you just need to believe in Jesus so your sins will be forgiven, you can go to heaven. What about peace? What about that work of transformation where Jesus takes us when we labor, we're heavy laden, we're broken hearted, and he does a work of transformation in our hearts and in our lives brings us peace, peace that transcends understanding. Jesus literally said, my peace I give to you, not as the world. The world cannot give to you this peace. It is it is a treasure and I give this to you. I have an article called The Gospel of Peace and the Healing of Hearts and I'm talking about how salvation is really more than a matter of just being forgiven, but it's also being transformed from a state of brokenness and sorrow and all, you know, life hits you in the face. We're, we all have wounds and scars and Jesus comes and brings us hope wholeness and we really need to understand that wholeness is essential to the gospel if not we will have a very destructive spirituality and you will hear about this all the time on this podcast but as I wrote in previous articles uh, I really came to a place where all the things that I had been taught were essential to following Jesus in the way that I should understand the Christian life which is like radical devotion holiness pursuing god i came to, to like this point where t- it sounded like the messages well i internalized this message of constant like surrender 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 give it all to god serve god god's your 100 percent. you know i decrease and he increase and it's kind of like a misuse of scripture because we're missing the part about us being whole and having joy uh this kind of it's like it's like i go to god and say oh uh, you want me to, whatever scripture says, uh, give you my all, take out my cross. Well, you know, I'm going to climb Mount Everest for you. And the end of it, I am going to throw myself into an altar of fire and be burned alive. And then, and then I feel like in my life personally, with this kind of spirituality of surrender that I had, um, God kind of like tore it out of my hands in the sense of, in a gentle, loving way to just make me relearn my fame. Like, no, no, no. I don't ask that of you this is destructive, this hurts you, I love you, that none of this is what it looks like to follow me. And following Jesus, Dietrich Bonhoeffer even said in The Cost of Discipleship, which I really clung unto messages like in The Cost of Discipleship, like Jesus calls me to come and die and I want to be like burned alive on that, you know, spiritual altar and whatever it was. And uh, Discipleship is not a path of our own choosing it's not the most difficult path possible it's not a stockholm spirituality or uh, a a very like extreme self-imposed religion of deprivation and sorrow that's not what it is if we're really about obedience we're not going to set standards for ourselves and for others that are unhealthy and what i mean by this is i literally saw a leader who emblem emblematizes this kind of like total living all for God thing. No other existence, no other reality in life except constant prayer, constant reading the Bible, constant ministry and preaching. And the people around this leader were trying to constantly keep up and live up to this ideal of spirituality laid out. And these people are like fast and have nothing but chicken soup for like, 40 days and then they'll be like I'm gonna do this all over again 
and then go on another 40 days. And they had bags around their eyes. They were constant. There was nothing. There was no holisticness to their Christian life. It was just constant devotion and prayer. Um, there's a story about how A.W. Tozer was uh, very much in favor of this kind of like constant spending so much time with God that his family felt that he didn't love them. And that's not what the Christian life is about. God doesn't ask you for that. God literally will not and does not in scripture ask us to have nothing in our lives except prayer and fasting and devotion and, and extreme piety. Nor does God ask us in our life to just have no desires and no, like, to empty ourselves and to make ourselves nothing as a way of life. So I think that's inimical to this kingdom of God that Paul describes as being righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And for me, it's a, a journey of relearning that. Um, so that's part of what peace means to me. Now, Matthew 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be ch called children of God. And the only comment that I would have on that is like two areas where peace is so miraculous and so hard won. Firstly, in our inner lives in ourselves and i want to talk about this in a future podcast about like the christian culture around anxiety preaching that anxiety is a sin and you just need to surrender more and trust more and like you just put the burden on people like if i have no anxiety and you have anxiety clearly i'm more spiritual than you are and clearly i have god more in my life more than you do and you're in sin like literally i think john piper actually preached that at one point, I will find the quote and uh, talk about it in a future podcast. But there you go. That's one thing. Like pe peace in our hearts, just the state of being whole and healed, that is so precious and that is also so hard. And secondly, peace in our relationships. Like shalom and wholeness, which also means health. It doesn't mean being in an unhealthy situation and being silent, it doesn't mean going along when leaders cover up abuse or spiritual abuse. It doesn't mean just going along and everyone just being yes, 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 and all that. Like There is no peace without safety and because safety is inherent in the understanding and meaning of peace. But just, just thinking about me, I'm not a person to be on a soapbox about being a peacemaker. Uh, oftentimes I start more arguments and uh, create social conflicts more than I, I think more than I am a peacemaker so this is an area that I really struggle with I'm not a person to be preaching about and say this is how you be a peaceable person uh, and, and to be honest sometimes we do need people who will not saying myself, but people who will not be willing to be okay with the status quo, who are going to care enough about safety or about righteousness that they're willing to rock the boat and be the so-called bad person in a situation that's really important too. But I'm just thinking about like friendships, community, church relationships. Don't know if you've ever been through like church splits, all of that. What does peace mean in those situations? What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Is it like a kind of perfect performance that we always have to have that end result that that is like neatly tied up together as a Christian story? Like, oh, we fought, there's so much bitterness, but at the end of the day, we just sit around the fire and sing Kumbaya and hold hands because somebody like destroyed themselves uh, emotionally to make sure that we are all on the same page. I don't think it's that. Um, I don't think it is as easy or as uh, neat as we would like it to be. And it may not fit into our expectations of what peace looks like. And that is like in ourselves, in our communities, not even talking about like, world peace for a second and solving those big conflicts i think some of us i mean maybe idealize that heroic story of like bringing being the person to to bring peace and reconciliation uh there's so much we could go into there when it comes to the misuse of forgiveness and rec reconciliation to allow abuse but anyway so we are called to be peacemakers. What that means, 
how difficult that is, how much we need the Holy Spirit, how much we need wisdom, how much we're willing to, I wouldn't not trust the process, but it's kind of like that trust the process vibe, how much we're willing to trust God, even when things don't seem as neat and easy as we would like them to be. Because we like everything tied up with a nice little bow and have a resolution and there are so many things in life with no resolution. And yeah. And then Ephesians 6.15, from which I get this podcast title, says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We must have a gospel of peace and that peace must be wholeness and healing and, and, and this supernatural, miraculous state of rest and I was, I was I was repeating the wholeness, but wholeness like just speaks to me so much. But yeah, wholeness too. Wow, that's a lot. So that's something to consider. Now I'm going to read to uh, to you a couple of verses that are the, about the gospel part of it. So we're talking about the kingdom of God being about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered, very truly, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. John 3 verse 5. So the kingdom of God, we're born into this kingdom of God when we're born again. Water and the spirit, I mean, I believe that probably refers to baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like this new life that we have as Christians. Acts 26 verse 18 says, To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we have these two states of being. We are chained under Satan's power here. And Jesus saves us and delivers us into the power of God and the kingdom of light, essentially. Colossians 1 verse 12 to 14 says the same thing. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. So it is a state of holiness, being part of the kingdom. And continuing, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So all of this is tied together. Being born again, redemption, forgiveness of sins, holiness, inheritance, kingdom of light. I would note, now this is probably less of something that Christians think about, but I will note that we have come to associate the scriptural principles of light and darkness and also just a general cultural understanding of day and night, light and darkness, and we have artificially put that on people, which makes no sense at all. But then we have created over centuries of history the culture has constructed this understanding that certain skin colors are considered light and certain skin colors are considered dark. And then we start to, and then this bias was developed, like these tropes and stereotypes about like the darker skin you are, the, the more like violent, or evil or untrustworthy. Um, these things were all present even in the medieval ages, something like that Othello, Shakespeare's Othello um, in the colonial era, just how that was artificially, like we somehow have put a race on it uh, historically. And so now there's some discussion in sort of the a different sphere, like a different discussion conversation than what I'm part of usually and what you guys are probably a part of. But that's something to consider uh, if you're going to be talking about light and dark just to bear in mind that we don't, that we are aware of these biases in society, of these constructions that automatically associate in our mind that have nothing to do with what scripture is teaching. That as far as I know, really is wasn't a thing in the first century and in the biblical period. Because apparently, like, we are mis mistaken in our understanding of like Greek and Roman and Egyptian culture of that time. Skin color, like there was a lot of diversity. There was a lot like 
just a lot of different skin colors and like Greek statues and like there's a lot of history to get into but certainly it wasn't a system of hierarchy that it is today this is just to give a sort of like clarity first of all just to be aware of that in having conversations and just to give like a disclaimer that when we associate like darkness with Satan we to totally need to repudiate that false eh, like that false thing that was created in society and that it's it's nominally there like I talked about Christian nationalism being part of the furniture of the Christianity we grew up in and globally around the world especially in countries with 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 people who are like poisoning themselves with skin whitening and stuff like that there's a lot of like classist um bias that comes in there there's a lot of so we need to yeah just be really clear and upfront that this part of that was wrong that's not what we're referring to when talking about light and darkness we're literally just talking about like the daytime and nighttime or used as used by these ancient israelites and ancient judeans as as a metaphor for good and evil as it was then and not as it has become now. Um, and to go back to the subject, uh, here we have a really, really, really clear depiction of what it means to be saved from one kingdom to another. Like two kingdom theology is so, so, so clear. There's the kingdom of Satan, there's the kingdom of God received from one and brought to the other. How clear and simple is that and I think that's part of the thing like analogy parables and metaphors used in the biblical period as Jesus constantly used throughout his life it's just so easy to remember because they are visual and pictorial so far um first Peter 2 9 but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light Philippians 2 15 that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation then you will shine among them like lights in the stars in the sky first John 1 9 when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, having nailed it to the cross and having disarmed principalities and powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Okay, my reference here is wrong. This is actually from Ephesians. Um, and I got confused with the next verse. But... Yes, this is about, again, this true, like the forgiveness, the sin part of it is a hundred percent part of it. But I also think that we misunderstand the fullness of the definition of sin and uh, that state of being in sin. So again, we have like, we were dead sins and then God forgave us. He kneeled um, the condemnation against us to the cross and he also triumphed over the powers of darkness as in of Satan. First John 1 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. So that is essential to salvation. So we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to be redeemed by Jesus? What and who were we enslaved to before we were redeemed by Jesus? So this is the part I'm going to get into that really brings the, the sort of kingdom theology, uh, the Anabaptist viewpoint into it that really explains like what is, what is, we, we understand sin, salvation, that part we get, we don't really get the violence and peace part of it, the violence being before and the peace being after. So let us really, really look at what scripture says about that and you know, what it means to come from, and I have an article about this, literally, lust, love, and the doctrine of two kingdoms. So we have, just to sort of outline it, right? You have sin, and then you have salvation and holiness. You have violence before, and then you have peace before. You have the way of lust, sinful desire, and then now you have the way of love. So, John 8, verse 42 to 44. And again, I like to really clarify a lot of things as we go, just like I did previously. 
I do not believe that this passage should be read in an anti-Semitic way. And it has been historically. I like to bring context in. You may not even realize this, but this passage has been used to sort of say that like Jewish people are evil and that Jesus believe Jesus was really like racist against them in a way that, or you know, what Jesus said justifies violence. Does not. That's not what I believe this passage is about. And I'm going to interpret it in a way that I think is consistent with kingdom theology. So Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I've come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth for there is no truth in him. Where When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. This part here, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. I think we need to take away like the terrible baggage around this passage and realize that when when we are in the dominion of Satan, under his power, the desires, the lust of Satan... Not just to just do sins for the sake of doing sins, but this lust to like murder, to lie, to do harm. Satan actively hates. Hatred belongs to Satan. The desire to do hateful and violent things belongs to Satan, sin, lust, and to this other kingdom, which operates according to these principles. So when you are bound to Satan, his evil, harmful, wicked desires are implanted. Um, They become your desires, our desires. John 10 verse 9 to 10 says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Steal, kill, and destroy. What are these things? These are violent acts. These are the desire to do harm. And Jesus is contrasting himself, the shepherd, the giver of life, with the thief. And I believe that this is referring to Satan and the way of Satan and desires that we have in Satan. Look, steal, kill, destroy. This is the way of empire. This is literally colonialism right there that people have the desire. They have this active desire to go out and do harm to someone else. And I believe that this is part of sin, like this lust, this desire, um, this vile hatred all comes from being having Satan's desires. The thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. This is the way of Satan. Uh, James 3, verse 13 to 18 Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Pausing here. There is a kind of wisdom that selfishness is a wisdom. It's a boastful, envious, bitter wisdom. It's an ambition to do harm. It's so clear from scripture that when we think of sin, we think of this like, I broke the Ten Commandments. I didn't keep God's laws. I We don't think about it in terms of this lustful desire to do harm to people. Because we don't think about relational dynamics in salvation. We think it's just me and God in this individual thing. We don't think about the, the relationships, the brokenness that sin brings about because of this desire, this selfish ambition, this earthly, unspiritual, and demonic wisdom. Continuing, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness this is incredible james one of my favorite epistles in scripture literally james is saying that like violence selfishness disorder 
all these things are acts that come from like this ambition, this, this lust within human beings. But when you are saved, the lust to do violence isn't there. You have the wisdom from heaven. You are peace loving. You are a peacemaker. You're considerate towards others. You yield. Uh, you are submissive. That's not just like a, an attribute for some people and not for others. This is literally uh, what it means to be a Christian. Now, in, in German, the Anabaptists have a term called Gelassenheit, which is yieldedness. And it's very closely related to love and non-resistance. And Gelassenheit is just like the submission to God. I know it's like, it can be misused for some people. Maybe it's like a traumatic word because it's misused to be like, oh yeah, uh, turn a blind eye to harmful things going on or allow harmful things to happen to you. And it's not what it is, but there's a certain submissiveness and, and Gelassenheit that comes from being filled with the spirit that's who we are as christians we're not to be like arrogant proud boastful aggressive uh er like like vulgar vile people we are to all be peace loving considerate submissive full of mercy and good fruit impartial we don't show bias to anybody and sincere i you mean I would love it if I were more like this. Like, I think this is what we should be as Christians. That would be an amazing witness. So we talk about hate and lust. First John 2 verse 9 to 11 says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. So that state of sin, the kingdom of this world, there is a deep hatred the desire to do evil to do harm and then first john 2 verse 15 to 17 really there's this concept is so clear throughout the new testament but it is so wonderfully clear here do not love the world or anything in the world if anyone loves the world love for the father is not in them for everything in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the father but from the world the world and its desires pass away but whoever does the will of god lives forever this is wonderful we have so they're saying the key what does it mean to be separated from the world to be a peculiar people to be not conformed to this world it is to reject the ways of lust and pride you know the thief still killing destroying based driven by lust by desire by hatred what is this that's imperialism and imperialism is not just what one country does to another country it's what one person does to another person it governs human relationships and yes human relationships still have a lot of good in them uh, simply because we are made in the image of god that's how we are wired so we are wired to be loving people just like our loving father, but then being having being in Satan's kingdom and under his power, these harmful desires are then implanted in us. And so there are two desires in us. That's what Romans 7 says. They're like, I have things fighting within me, the good that I desire to do, I do not do. Because guess what? We are created with that desire to do good. We're created with the desire to love others. And when we love others, we feel wonderful because that was that was what we were created to do. All this lust and pursuit of pride and all that will never satisfy us. It will make us miserable and unhappy and and it and it will destroy our souls. But here it says literally there are two ways of being. There is the father's love and there is the world's lust. The lust that destroys and the love that gives life. Two different ways of being in this world. We really need to understand that lust is not just like the, oh, some desire to do some like weird thing that God doesn't want us to do. It is how we relate to another person. It's not just about the Ten Commandments. If you really look at the Ten Commandments, like, or even the law, like, love your neighbor as yourself. Do not cover, do not uh, steal, do not do harm to your neighbor. Uh, J James says this love does no harm to the neighbor because love is the fulfillment of the law I think it was James who said that though it could be in Romans 
All right, so Colossians. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, again, this whole like kingdom of Satan thing, uh, why is still living... Why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not touch, do, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which all have to do with things that are, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on mere human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they elect any value in restraining sensual indulgence we think of the flesh as just being oh the sin nature the old man do we think about it in terms of this desire to fulfill this driving unsatisfiable lust to indulge ourselves at the expense of others to harm them to hate them and then the human solution to that is simply to come up with rules to try and restrain it and you will see this across many religions, including Christianity. The, the thing that they think is that discipline and restraint is going to somehow do something about that lustful nature. And these things can coincide, like the Roman Stoicism and discipline went side by side with violence and selfish desire in the institution of slavery. For example, like slave and slavers slave masters were seen as having this high level of self-discipline and so they were equipped more than the slaves themselves to be masters of the slave like they literally took this whole self-restraint uh in self-restraint restraint of indulgence stoicism and uh asceticism asceticism can't pronounce it they took all that to justify slavery which was not only a very violent practice but was also a practice entirely based on owning the body of another person and content warning having full rights to sexually assault another person and it's not considered assault it's just considered exercising your rights to establish your power over another person anyway so Paul talks about being brought to the kingdom of God, setting out hearts and things above. And then he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you also, you must also rid yourself of all of these things. All such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Christ is all and, and in all. So again, we have... The New Testament authors from James to John to Paul talking about this burning, earthly, sensual desire, lust, greed, evil, uh, to, again, hate, harm, and just do evil to fulfill our lusts. All right. Um, but therefore, God, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Such a difference to lust. Where lust, exi lust exists, you're not going to have compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Um, then literally it ends by this, okay? It ends by referring to all of these sins, what it's like to be before you save and after you save. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. What is all this saying? All this is saying is that before we were saved, we did not have the desire to do peace. We were in a state of violence towards others. And that is a state of sin, of being enslaved to Satan and Satan's lust. So let's talk about Galatians 5 and let's try to read that in this light. Understanding that salvation is not the way that we understand sin versus salvation. We have missed out completely the violence versus peace aspect of this. 
and the relational aspect because salvation the kingdom of god calls us into a place of relational wholeness Galatians 5 verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then further on, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Why why does Paul contrast these things? He contrasts serving and indulging our own flesh versus serving one another humbly, being servants of one another. Why? Because one is pride and one is humility. One is using others, exploiting others, forcing them to serve us. And the other is literally becoming servants of one another in a very mutual way. We are servants of one another. No one gets to be the one who puts their feet up and, and gives orders and dominates and commands here. Everyone is servants of one another. Uh, we all submit to one another, as Colossians, uh, Ephesians 5.21 says. Then continuing what Paul says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be destroyed to one another, uh, destroyed by one another. Again, pause. Here, literally, harm, sin is a state of harm, biting, devouring one another. There's indulging your lust and this is so clear two kingdom theology and the way of relating as a way of relating as a way of and, and all this related to salvation is like clear 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 across every single passage that i have read and across the entire new testament and you can go back to the torah the first five books of moses the law of moses exodus deuteronomy it's there as well why do we miss that why do we think it's just about my sin rather than realizing that part of sin is the desire to bite and devour and serve ourselves and indulge our flesh and to steal, to kill, destroy? I don't know. I think there's a good reason for that, which is to make salvation, as Bender said, like this intellectual doctrine, this intellectualized abstract thing that has no bearing on our relational relationships with one another and i will say this we have often thought about holiness as being purely about our relationship with god how much we read the bible how sinless we are how much we're set free from something like a pornography addiction we don't think of relational holiness relational holiness meaning restored relationships peace with one another viewing another person not as the source of your sin or temptation but as a human being loved by god that is healing that is holiness holiness is not just like having no more desire to watch porn or being be able to overcome your desire to watch porn it is because porn literally involves indulging the flesh by harming biting and devouring one another it requires us to change our frame completely and that is why so much of the evangelical teachings on purity pornography sexual addiction are so 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 lacking because we are not thinking about relational holiness and shalom. Okay, continuing with Paul. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So we have the Spirit, we have the flesh. We have lust, we, we have love, we have lust. We have the Father's love, and we have the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, bread of life. So I can go on and on. We have the shepherd who lays down his life and we have the thief who kills and takes life. I'm probably repeating at this point, but you're really getting the idea that there's something here in the New Testament that we are not getting when we are only talking about it in terms of the Roman road. Uh, they are in conflict with one another so that you're not to... So you are not to do whatever you want, but you, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live by this, this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. 
Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. So again, crucifying the flesh is not just crucifying your desire to like break God's rules and do sinful things. It's also that fleshly desire that manifests itself in the exact opposite of Jesus's love. Jesus's love was manifested to us in this, in this that he died for us. All the time that I had thought about holiness, I really thought it was just about devotional living, about obeying God's commands, even things like love and caring for one another, which is very important to holiness, were, were only in relation to like God. So like this relational holiness takes second place to like the personal devotional piety, uh, sinlessness type of view of salvation. And when I realized that what we are saved from is one relational like mode of being to another completely different relation like completely different relationship to other people uh that has been a light bulb so that is what the gospel of peace means to me it's being saved from the the way of the flesh to uh, the bitter envy and the desire to do harm and indulge the flesh at the expense of others to be saved from the way of violence into the way of peace because the kingdom of god is about righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit and then we realize righteousness there's no righteousness without peace. We have constructed a righteousness without peace because we apparently think Christians can murder and kill and take out the sword and be full of vengeance and, and, and nationalism and imperialism, whatever else we think is compatible with the gospel. No, it is not. There is no righteousness without peace. And unless we deal with the inner lusts, the lust for violence and self-gratification, the lust to steal, kill, and destroy, we don't actually have the full gospel. And therefore, peace, a peace theology, uh, love and non-resistance, as Harold Bender calls it, this is essential to the gospel. So I don't, I am curious what you have heard in relation to like, what is lust? What is the flesh? What is sin? Have you heard about it in this way? Have you thought about it in relation to like violence and peace, the kingdom of this world versus the kingdom of God? How do you frame the understanding of like being born again into the kingdom? What does the kingdom mean to you? I'm curious. I believe that these passages in really dealing with the root of violence, not just violence as an action, but violence as a desire implanted by satan to carry out his desires and satan just really wants to everybody to just kill each other and hate each other and dominate each other and and for the world to devolve into chaos and because he hates this world he hates everything that god created he hates the beauty of nature he also hates people and therefore he wants people to be destroyed to destroy one another and to be also destroyed in their souls so like yeah the ultimate evil and the ultimate love. Uh, have you heard about it in this way? Maybe you have. Maybe, maybe my understanding of justification, sanctification, and atonement of and the, my understanding of sin and holiness even were, was not what you came to understand. But this is sort of a breakthrough for me, seeing it in this bigger light. And, and also seeing peace theology and Anabaptist political theology as essentially about, it's a, it's a gospel issue. A lot of things are made into gospel issues, but this is the actual gospel issue that we have here. So that's all for today. I have really enjoyed this two-part series, um, going through some of the basics, as it were about what it means to have the gospel of peace and be peacemakers. Um, and I look forward to more episodes, more conversations. So do get in touch if you have comments, if you want to relate to or, you know, talk about anything that you have heard on this podcast. Oh, and I might add abuse, right? We don't think about sin and abuse. Uh, we don't think about like sinful desire in the flesh having to do with abuse, but that's what abuse is. Like abuse, imperialism, Stealing, killing, destroying, hating, harming, they're all the same thing. 
and we should be safe from that desire to abuse others for our own gratification out of anger or whatever it is so um i will see you all soon and god bless